Hello everyone, um, my name is Nicola Carter, I'm a community learning disability nurse from the Redbridge team and um, today I'm going to talk about communicating pain and illness. So welcome along. I move on to the next slide. So we've developed this presentation um, to enable carers and family members to be able to support um, people that they're working with or within their family learning disabilities to be able to communicate their pain and distress. We're going to be looking at particular tools that will help you um, um, observe distress and pain and be able to link it to possible um, causes or factors. We're going to be looking at pain, both physical and psychological distress. And we hope that some of these tools you might be able to use um, within your settings or at home. So just moving on. Before we actually get to look at some of the tools, I just wanted to look at some of the myths around pain and some of the things that we experience as learning disability nurses when we talk to family members and carers. That um, a lot of the time pain can cause a lot of distress for individuals and those that may not be able to communicate verbally their pain we see that the what the way that they are communicating can be misinterpreted as changing behavior and we hear this a lot it's just how they are and therefore the symptoms are ignored um, another thing around um, working with um, adults uh, with learning disabilities um, we see that their you know their cognitive impairment it, it again affects their ability to communicate their pain and we feel that a lot of the time that makes the um, family member or the carer um, it's uncertain how best to assess their pain and they're not sure whether this is actual pain or is it they're communicating something else. Um, and we obviously a lot of the time with people with, learning disabilities, with severe impairments who we know have difficulty com completing the self-report reporting of pain. So we're hoping that using some of these tools might help um, um, individuals feel confident to support those with learning disabilities. We want to be able to look at um, managing these areas because we are aware, again, in the work that we do, that a lot of the people that we, we work with don't actually receive um, regular pain management when potentially they are in pain. Um, or it's not considered as could this be a, a physical pain for somebody. Um, and we know that in learning disabilities, um, where there's an increased level of unmet health needs and um, there's a risk of um, ongoing undiagnosed um, health issues and that could potentially be impacting on that person's quality and um, expectancy of life. So just moving on. So again, before we get to the tools, it's just a little bit about thinking around um, how before we start to monitor what actually in terms of pain and distress. Um, we always say that it's best to start um, with how does the individual present when they're content or they're not in pain. I think knowing the person is key um, and it helps identify and do a comparison of when you are doing, when the person is possibly in distress or in some kind of pain. Um, it, so I said it gives a good basis of comparison. So when you do go on to use the tools, you, you will see that a lot of the tools will say, how does the person normally present? Um, that if a person is displaying new behaviours, then we always say, and this is our sort of our ground rules as LD nurses and especially in behaviour and, and, and specialists as well, rule out the physical health issues first. Okay, so, you know, ensure that the person's um, accessed their annual health check. Do they need a blood test? Have they got ongoing health issues that maybe not have been checked? Um, you know, say for instance, thyroid levels, when was the most recent um, blood test? Just do a check that there's nothing else going on for that person. And then we also say, and this is really key to a lot of the assessments, we always say alongside a pain assessment that you identify um, or you monitor, sorry, um, sleep patterns, um, menstrual um, cycles or you know identify is this person maybe perimenopausal uh, or menopausal um, we also haven't put it on there but bowel monitoring again we it's a little bit cliche nurses we go on about bowel monitoring but 
um, they're very, um, in, they can indicate if potentially someone is constipated, maybe that's impacting on um, a urine infection and having those, um, having those monitoring forms helps uh, develop a picture of what's going on for that person. Um, again, I haven't put any examples of the monitoring forms, but I will send them as attachments so people can access them if, if they would like to. So moving on to um, the first um, aim assessment tool. So this was one that was actually um, developed by one of the nurses that I worked with. Um, the column on the left, you'll see um, uh, the descriptors. You'll see these main descriptors throughout the assessment tools that we'll be looking at. And so you've got face, jaw movement, eyes, body and skin, vocal sounds, speech, habits and mannerisms, body posture and body observations. And then in the column next to that, you have appearance when content and next to that appearance when distressed. So as I said at the beginning, we like to look at, at how the person is um, in terms of their, how content they are. So how in terms of um, when they're relaxed and content um, and in no pain or no distress, how would they look? How would their facial um, and, and mannerisms body mannerisms maybe vocal sounds um, and then there's a comparison to how they would be potentially when they're distressed or, or in pain if it has been observed before it might very, be very subtle um, the descriptions you can use you could do word descriptions you could put pictures in there um, to describe that you can make these um, assessment tools as person-centered as you as you can involve the person if, if that's possible um, if they want to write up their own descriptors um, and so that's quite an easy kind of basic one sheet, kind of almost a grab sheet if, if needed, as later on we'll talk about hospital passports and communication passports. Um, and this one can be easily adapted um, to whatever situation you're with the person and the level of learning disability they've got. So moving on. So um, we use these a lot, the um, Wong and Baker faces. Um, and these, these actually originated from um, children's um, services. They use, use the pictures um, with children in hospital. Um, with the, these are good, but the only thing with these is that if you're working with someone with autism that might not recognise um, facial um, expressions, um, and also there's wording and the numbers, potentially that might impact on somebody as well. They might not understand that. Um, so again, this might be used with someone with maybe possibly milder learning disabilities, um, and um, and that that can maybe engage with that, or maybe understand obs observe those changes, the graduation in changes of faces. This is a little. So just moving on. So again, you'll see as we move on through the tools, there's examples of, you'll see that the Wong and Baker faces have been pulled down into these pain thermometers. And they're called that obviously, as you can see, um, with the, the visual um, description of the, the thermometer. But there, again, here now, the change we have is the graduation in colors. So again, green mean, meaning good, meaning go, red meaning not so good, bad, or stop a lot of our clients understand that um, obviously you've got that very um, the, the colors in between sort of the light yellow and the amber it might be difficult for people to understand that um, and again you've got the descriptive words as well and again these words can be might be difficult for people and again it's just something just to think about how how people describe pain so we can say pain and a lot of time we understand what that would mean that um, just consider how your client describes pain. It could be um, hurt, sore, um, maybe even itchy, or you know, think about all the different kinds of descriptors. They might even have another kind of description for pain um, that might not mean anything to anybody else. Again, if you can get that down on a pain assessment tool, that's fantastic. And again, just to highlight, if anything like that, you'll see there's a pain, um, um, a pain, uh, area on the hospital passport and I know Jason will be talking about that after very specific around um, if you could some more information on how someone um, 
describes pain and reacts to pain and how best to manage. And as you can see, we've, we've now lost the Wong and Baker faces and we've just got the clear um, graduation in, in numbers, increasing numbers and graduation in colours. Again, this is a little bit more solid. You've got the green and the amber and the red. The RAG rating, again, we see that a lot. You can see it in hospital passport. Um, green, okay, amber, not so good, and red is really bad. The thing I like this as well, and I always suggest if you've got a body map available to always um, support someone to be able to identify where on their body, and that's very simple front to back. Again, you could be working with someone that maybe doesn't understand parts of their body. So if that, if you know that as part of an assessment that somebody wouldn't know where their elbow is or their head or their knee, you know, you can be very clear and put, wouldn't be able to identify on their, their own body. Um, I've also put in a picture of um, this, you know, again, we, we've put it as pain, but you know, if you're working with someone, again, we talk about people with autism might not understand that emotion and actually, some other people might think, well, the person could be tired or maybe they're just, they're just rubbing their neck or, you know, it doesn't always mean discomfort, but it could work for some people. Again, this is um, individualised, um, consider how it might work for somebody and might not. So it's just thinking about the person you're working with. Okay, so moving on. So this is um, the Abbey Pain Scale. Now the difference with the tools that we're going to start looking at now, um, this one is more specific with scoring. So this one scores, which again, sometimes it makes it a little bit easier for people because they can actually see the progression of the pain or maybe the impact of pain management on that pain. Um, so you've got six questions, again, very similar to the descriptors on the first one. Vocalisation, facial expression, changing body language, behavioural changes, physiological changes and physical changes. Okay. And you literally, it's either absent at so zero, mild is one, moderate is two, and severe is three. And you score how you perceive that person. Maybe they might be able to, it, to score it, but this is more about someone potentially who can't verbalise. And I suppose this is where subjectivity comes into it. You know, one person might score it, um, more one might score it less but we talk about making sure you involve the full team or the family within this the people that know this person really well and then you do a total pain score um, and it indicates at the bottom as you can see that they're saying 0 to 2 is no pain 3 to 7 is mild 7 to 13 is moderate and 14 plus is severe so it gives you an idea about you know the um, whether this pain is actually increasing and we're looking at whether it's chronic or whether it's acute or acute on chronic. So if you've already got somebody that has um, uh, presenting um, long-term health conditions that potentially do um, um, flare up, you can get an idea whether this is whether this should need um, emergency um, medical services or whether it's something you can manage at home. Okay. So just moving on to the next one. So again, this is just um, a description. I've just read this out, really. There's, there's not much difference to what I've just um, talked about. But I suppose the good thing about this is that if you're working with someone that's in pain, you could potentially um, do it over any period of time. So you could assess them as being in severe pain and administer pain um, management medication and then maybe four hours after that if that's paracetamol or six hourly if it's um, ibuprofen you could then monitor it again and just to see and score whether there's been um, an, an, an actual um, decrease in that person's presentation of pain. You could also use that if there has been no change that's your evidence to say well look we've used this medication and nothing's happened and we really need to look at um, seeking further support um, medical advice on this so, that's that one. so moving on so this is the disability distress assessment tool i'm going to bring that up so we can have a look look through it so going back to the very first tool that I showed um, with the, the domain areas, the tutorial basic pain assessment. 
the, the actual um, the descriptors have been pulled from the dispatch tool. So I'm just going to um, see if I can remember how to do this. I'm just going to end the show and bring you up the distact tool. Here we go. So as you can see, in, you put obviously the information of the person at the top who's been completing it. And the good thing with this one, again, you, um, you note when the person's content. So the one prior to this, the Abbey Payne scale, is there's, there's no comparison to how the person was. I mean, you could do you could do a descriptor alongside, it, but this one, um, will, you can go through all of the descriptors and put how that person presents when they're content. So as you can see, it's their appearance when content and distress. So we're looking at the face, and it goes into a bit more detail than the pictorial basic pain assessment that we first talked about. So face looks about tongue, jaw, skin, eyes. Then you've got the sounds and the speech. And remember, sometimes, you know, we have to be really careful how we describe when someone is content and stressed because there might be a slight change in maybe the tone or the pitch um, or even the volume. It might be the same sound, but, you know, being clear in that description and remembering someone else might be reading this, whether that's a new member of staff or maybe if someone's gone into hospital, we want to be very clear how we're describing um, pain and how someone presents with pain. We don't want people to be, again, going back to that first few slides, oh, this is person with learning disabilities, this is how they present, they make this vocal sound. We want people to be very clear that maybe that, that person just slightly changed in, their, in, in how they're presenting and it could be a potential um, distress or pain. We've got habits and mannerisms um, and posture and observation. These are, quite, these are quite detailed at the beginning, but this is how they are content and distress. So when we actually know, then there's known triggers of distress there. What do we know? What causes someone to feel distressed or potentially more so that we could be putting in things like environment, um, you know, maybe the person's got a particular dislike to certain objects or, or certain sensory um, aspects, um, maybe it um, gets too hot, too cold you can put things in there be as detailed again as possible so moving on this is about the communication level of the person again just generally um, not something for the actual pain that you're you're um, assessing and then we actually go on to um, when that person's actually in pain so you can be very very detailed here you can add um, other descriptions on others but again, this is on appearance of this is facial signs, jaw movement. It's very detailed for the and they've got aspects of the eyes. Um, and this is skin. And then we've got the vocal sounds. Again, I like this because it, it does tell you very clear, you know, really right how it sounds. You know, talking about the volume, the pitch, duration. You know, is this is it is it like a sudden cry? A cry out or is it just a long-term moan is it when the person's being moved you know when what when is this actually happening for the person and we've got the speech and habits and mannerisms you know what's normal for that person you know how do they normally present well we know that from doing the content what's happening when they're distressed okay so you can do this um distat tool before any, it doesn't have to be when someone's in pain. This, this should, you know, you could do this and just have it as a, as a go-to reference. You could do it also at the time someone's distressed, so you could be monitoring that. Um, similarly to the Abbey Pain Scale, but this is not scored. Again, this is just observations. Okay, so it goes on this really good information I've actually pulled out for the presentation about new, is this a new sign or behaviour? And it gives you quite good pointers as to what potentially the pain could be related to. It's not asking you to diagnose, it's just giving you an idea. What have you considered? It, you know, are there other areas is it related to? Um, so I'm just going to go back to scroll down so this will be available this will be added on um 
to the presentations and you'll be able to access these if you like to view them. I'm just going to go back to the... Um, okay. So just moving on to the next one. So this is the areas that I was saying that actually are on the DISTAC tool. I really like this because it does get you to think about um, where, when and where is this happening for the person. Again, not a diagno diagnostic tool for the person. Don't feel like you're being left to, do, to decide what, what's actually happening for, for this person. But just to consider, you know, is it related to maybe when they're, when they're eating or is it related to um, um, when they're going to the toilet? Um, you know, are they more distressed when they're being moved? Are they more distressed because they're in a different environment? Do you see this um, distress um, or related to, um, you know, being with other people that maybe they don't know? You know, trying to eliminate possible, it's not just pain, but it is about distress, okay? And it helps people just to go through a process to rule out what it could possibly be. Like I said at the beginning, this is what we do as learning disability nurses. We're presented with someone that might be distressed, potentially in pain. Let's rule out the physical health issues first. Let's make sure that, you know, we've offered pain management um, medication. But again, you know, that you're seeking advice to, as to whether it is a possible infection. You know, what, what else could be happening for this person? Has there been any changes in their environment? Um, has there been any changes of staff? any issues within the family you know think you have to think a lot wider and holistically with people with learning disabilities don't get caught up with it's a physical pain um, let's not miss out anxiety um, depression you know because these affect people with learning disabilities as well okay so just moving on so just to finally you know go over what we've discussed um, and I just want to go back to um, the monitoring tools again i do get caught up on these because of a very good reason we know a lot of very basic health issues are mi missed for people with learning disabilities and again um constipation is one of them so you know make sure that you're that you have the monitoring forms in place you know is the person sleep deprived you know why are they not settling at night you know consider if they've got epilepsy do you need have you been monitoring their epilepsy um, the bowel monitoring is very key. Like I said, we're having a lot of, we're seeing a lot of people learn just is with undiagnosed constipation, and it is leading to um, significant health complications and even to um, um, to death as well. So these are really key things to do in conjunction with a pain assessment tool. Um, you know, again, as I said, thinking about distress, thinking about emotional, physical, and psychological, and that. You know, one thing, a minor issue for some might be particularly major to another. Um, and that's for all of us um, and our experiences. And again, I've mentioned about working together as a team and in partnership with the family. And if signs are recognised early, and this is key, and we say this around sort of things like um, bowels um, and bowel monitoring, and if we, can pick, if we can identify them early, you know, people who are having problems, we can get interventions in place and we can avoid um, you know, untimely um, deaths of people, learn disabilities or crisis. Um, and that, you know, reassessment is essential. We need to make sure, you know, if there's no improvement or the deterioration, we need to follow that up. And one of the other things I mention and I talk a lot and recognise uh, with um, staff and family carers is sepsis. You know, there's lots of information out there, but just always have that information up on those very subtle signs of sepsis um, again not to be missed with anything else if you've got concerns and you know you um, contact um, contact and get um, advice as soon as possible you know don't leave it if you're concerned about somebody um, again like I say the sepsis information is available um, I always say print up print that up and put it somewhere so you can it just jogs your mind just to be observant of that Okay, so just moving on. So I mentioned this again, um, very key to incorporate any pain descriptors, any pain assessment at all that you've done. So if you've done something, if you've done a dissect tool for someone when they're content and how they look when they're distressed, you know, pop it in the hospital passport or you can attach the one 
the one page assessment tool maybe to the communication passport we know Jason will talk about the hospital passports they can be quite long but I would say this is key information people need to know about how someone presents when they're in distress not just pain but distress you know and it helps the staff in the hospitals because they don't sometimes consider um, some of the things that we would do in the specialist LD services um, also, you can add, add these to the COVID-19 passports, um, again, very key to potentially if somebody does need to go into hospital. So I've also added the useful links at the end um, and you can access those. I will add the other information I've talked about. I'll try and put a bowel monitoring chart in. We've got some epilepsy monitoring as well. But if you've got any concerns about anybody that you're working with, you can contact your local community learning disability team. Um, you can talk to nurses, but um, you can talk to any um, professional within those teams if you need any support. And I'd just like to say thank you for listening. And I know there'll be some uh, frequently asked questions that will be posted as well, so you can access those. Thank you very much. <laughs>